Anthony, take over. Thanks, Lee. Did you? And Anthony, you'll have to uh, unmute and- He's unmuted. Yep. Show us your video. All righty, good evening, everybody. There he is. I'm uh, happy to be here with you all. My name is Anthony Rosillas. I am currently, uh, I, in my day job, I am the executive director of the Oregon Teacher Standards and Practices Commission. And I am one of three candidates for the Democratic nomination for Senate District 11. Um, the first question you asked, why am I running? Well, Senate District 11 is a newly drawn district. Many people remember it as Peter Courtney's seat uh, and, and that was when the boundaries were pretty much from Woodburn to Salem, but mm -hmm. east of the five freeway. This district now, it basically straddles both sides of Interstate 5 from Woodburn and now includes Kaiser, as well as the northern part of Salem, in addition to Jervis and the Brooks communities. This is a very diverse district. This district is now one of the more diverse districts in the state, and not only in terms of demographics, but in terms of industry, because we see everything from agricultural to commercial, to retail, to manufacturing, as well as, of course, since it includes the capital uh, quad of the, of the Salem area, it also includes a lot of the professional services sector in the state. So with this, district being as diverse as it is now, I believe it's time for leadership in this district that really can represent the entirety of the district. And that really can take the perspective, not only of what it is to lead from the local level, but to make things happen at the state level. So a few things moving on now to our second question that um, you have for me this evening. I am a Latino from a blue collar home with farming roots. And I was the first in my family to be able to go to college. I believe that more than any other of the Senate candidates in this Senate District 11 race, that I know the personal challenges that many people within this Senate district struggle with every day in order to put food on the table and get ahead. I remember going with my father and mother into the uh, public assistance to welfare office when his union, you know, when they went on strike and he needed to get food stamps for us. And the union people told my parents that uh, when you go in to get your food stamps, make sure you take your kids with you because it would, it would give a better impression of your need to have these. Um, and that's when I was like this yay big, right? And that really left an impression on me and ever since uh, my days in high school, I've been dedicated to public service. So I've been a lifelong educator over 25 years as an educator, everything from a substitute teacher all the way up to a superintendent of schools. And I, now I lead one of the state's uh, five education agencies. And I've been doing that for over four years now. Uh, so in my campaign, the key questions I have in my campaign were, is basically, do current legislators and candidates truly understand and represent the aspirations of working families. The partisan politics and representing the status quo continue to plague the legislature. And I believe Oregon needs diverse leadership that reaches across the aisle and puts our futures before their past. So as a Senator, some of the key issues that I would fight for is of course, fair wages, and workplace protections for all employees, particularly our traditionally marginalized employees, our farm workers, our construction trades, a lot of our itinerant workers across the state that whether they, uh, that they have jobs that are very limited in scope and time and how well are we protecting them with good benefits and affordable housing. I believe in affordable, accessible and quality healthcare for all Oregonians. The time has passed when we can believe that having a, a purely market-driven healthcare system really provides a benefit to every Oregonian, let alone any one particular Oregonian. And I'll speak about that in, in, in a minute. Uh, affordable housing and a comprehensive rather than a disjointed plan 
to address the root causes of homelessness. I'll also talk about this one in a moment in a little bit more detail with a few examples. I believe our education system was designed uh, for the 1920s. I often call the education system the Model T. And you know, while we've done a lot of great things over the years to try to replace some of the parts in the Model T, the Model T does not work on today's superhighways. And likewise, our education system, the COVID pandemic has shown that the school systems the way they are, we need to adapt to the times and to the best learning practices there are. And we need to make sure that our schools are being funded for what's needed tomorrow, not based on what we did yesterday. And that's an important piece in overall state government leadership because the way the state government has, has traditionally been budgeted and funded is based on historical budgeting. All us agencies, what we do is we first start and do what they call current service level. We determine what would it take in the next biennium to do the exact same things we did in this biennium. Historical budgeting does have some benefits, but it is not the type of budgeting that will move Oregon to where it needs to be in the future. What we need to do is really do project and in some ways back to zero based budgeting and start from scratch and looking at it, what does it really take to get the things done we, that our Oregon, Oregonians and our families deserve to have happen in our state. I believe in, of course, responsible natural resource use and climate protection. And again, my whole model is about principled leadership today for tomorrow's future. And that's because with many of these items that we as Democrats hold dear, the economy, the environment, healthcare, We've, we quickly realized that we cannot separate what we're doing today with the impacts they're gonna have on our future. If we don't think about how we're addressing healthcare for everyone today, how will we be able to address it for tomorrow? If we're not thinking about maintaining and protecting, conserving our resources and environment and climate, what will we have for our children? Now, while we do this, we also have to be responsible stewards of taxpayer resources and funds. We need a tax system that addresses the community needs while also reducing the burden on the working families and small businesses. Those that, that most rely on the dollars earned in hardworking jobs. Of course, we needed to provide programs that incentivize innovation in responsive communities. And what I will commit to you and to the people of Senate District 11 is that I will lead with the personal values of faith, heritage, perseverance, and social justice as my guiding forces in my work. Uh, I mentioned uh, that I would give you an example uh, about how I feel that my leadership is different from what a lot of traditional leadership is in uh, Salem. I at TSBC, I work on the core, my building is on the corner of Front Street and Division Street. Um, if you've been watching the news, we had a, a horrible tragedy this last weekend where on the corner of Front Street and Division Street, uh, a car, apparently a drunk driver, uh, plowed into uh, a group of homeless uh, people who were asleep and killed four people. And if you watch parts of the news on it, you can actually see the TSBC logo on our building up there. It's right across the street. Well, this is an example of what I think we need to work on in the legislature. The legislature tends to deal with issues in silos. You know, we have a House and a Senate Ed Committee, a Housing Committee, a Health Care Committee. And legislators often advocate for policies that really are looking at short-term fixes. And what we need are policies that are very comprehensive and consider that any policy we do needs to be connected to the broader community and has impacts on the broader community, as well as any of the policies we do today are gonna have impacts in future generations. So that's an example, yeah. Anthony, sorry yes. to interrupt you, but we would like to 
maybe if there are still questions, Bernie, that he's missed. And also we'd like to open up the floor to uh, other people if they have questions for you. Yes, thank you. Bernie, did he catch the questions? Yes, so I mentioned um, on yeah. the questions, I mentioned my key uh, issue areas. Right. Let me see no, no, I think we got that. Let's go ahead and get some questions from the audience. Yeah. Thanks, Joyce. <clears throat> I bet Lee has one. Let's Sorry. give folks in the audience a chance to. Oh, Karen has a question. <clears throat> Karen? Yes, I have a question. I, I um, am also in education and I, I appreciate your comments about, you know, removing the silos so that we can address some of these, these um, big issues that are facing, that we're facing. How would you do that? How would you remove those silos to address some of the bigger issues like, you know, homelessness and drug yes. addiction, those kinds of things? Can you, well, can you address that? that's a great, great question, Karen. Um, and being with my experience in developing state budgets and also in developing policy and working with legislators, one of the things that we can do is really when we look at how our legislative concepts are developed, uh, we need to do a better job of making sure that our concepts, when they're filed, that they not only address the fiscal impacts to particular agencies or a policy area, but that they more thoroughly discuss and demonstrate that they've engaged in stakeholders in the different areas that, uh, that are applicable to the policy. And Karen, here's where I will mention the Student Success Act. As an educator, you will, you will I'm sure you may, will appreciate this. The Student Success Act a few years ago put a lot of resources into the education system. And it, what, what it was proposed to do, purported to do, was to really support the social emotional needs of our students. So that way we can create safe, effective learning environments. Great idea, very necessary. But when the legislature did their tour across the state and enacted this bill, I can tell you, they never once reached out to me and my agency. And here was the problem that they put all this money and they, raise the hopes of the community that all these social emotional supports, all these counseling services, all these psychologists, they were all gonna be able to be put into the schools and help our students. But no one stopped to ask the question. Anthony. Where's the workforce? Anthony, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, but you know, our time is, is short as <laughs> we've said, uh, and we have another candidate that's next coming up. So I, you know, should we give him a minute to, to close? Lee did, you, Lee, did you have one thing you just want to add real quickly? No, just uh, if Anthony could give us his elevator speech on why he's the best candidate. And uh, so we can finish up and move on. Thank you, Anthony. Yes. Thank you. So uh, in, in closing, what I would say is policies are only as good as their ability to be implemented. As a lifelong educator and public servant, I know what it takes to make policies work at the state level. In fact, I'm the only candidate to have statewide leadership experience in this race, as I have fought for equitable schools, adult learning opportunities, and fair justice practices. Unlike many leaders who struggled during the pandemic, I was able to help lead TSBC through COVID while addressing quickly needed rules and policies to help keep our schools open. I believe the time is now for the leadership experiences, the values and beliefs that I bring to Salem to support the communities of Senate District 11. Very Thank good. You. Thank you, Anthony.